uh, uh, can be done for a number. Of, sorry, can be done for a number of reasons, um, and that includes you know people who go for things like whole body MRIs as uh, screening investigations um, at the age of fifty, which is something that I believe happens in in parts of the country. Um, this has resulted in and and and. Cross-sectional imaging done for any one of a number of reasons has resulted in increased detection of, of cystic neoplasms. An important issue, and we'll obviously we'll go through this a little bit later, but MRI has probably has the greatest sensitivity and can detect lesions in up to 50% of people. And that correlates with autopsy studies, which have a similar uh, detection rate of about 50%. So I think the important thing to appreciate here is that pancreatic cysts are actually pretty common. Um, and this relates to age as well. So the older you are, this correlates with the presence of, uh, of a cystic neoplasm. And seeing as it's that so common, it's important to appreciate, therefore, that probably the majority of these are benign. Um, and probably most of them don't need anything done about them. But we know that there is a malignant potential. Um, there are certain things that go with that. Diabetes is important, and it's suggested to even have a causative link in terms of IPMN, especially in patients that are insulin requiring. Um, and of course, 10 to about 50% of patients with IPMN in turn have diabetes. So certainly there, there is um, a link there, as has been thought to be with, with uh, ductal adenocarcinoma as well. Um, and in tandem with that, um, patients with IPMN in, in turn are at increased risk of, of ductal adenocarcinoma as well. And of course, we know that patients with chronic pancreatitis have an increased risk of ductal adenocarcinoma and, and again, uh, also have an increased risk of IPMN. So certainly, um, as we've said, this is a common problem. Most of the time, it's going to be benign, but at times it's not. And there's certain things that we need to be on the lookout for in terms of being risk factors. So when we look at pancreatic cysts or cystic lesions overall, we appreciate certainly the vast majority of, of them are going to be um, uh, inflammatory in nature and, and benign. So, uh, so the first thing when you see a patient with a pancreatic cyst is to inquire, you know, is there a significant history in keeping with pancreatitis? Um, does the cyst, um, uh, is it in keeping with the clinical picture of the patient having developed a pseudocyst following uh, an inflammatory cause? Having said that, it's important not to get lulled into sort of a false sense of security um, or, or uh, a mistaken understanding that um, the cyst is the consequence of the pancreatitis, because certainly a number of the cystic tumors in turn can cause pancreatitis. And we've certainly seen cases where patients were diagnosed with a pseudocyst when in fact it was a cystic tumor, um, and that is what was causing the, the, the pancreatitis in the first place. And the clues here really lie in careful clinical assessment, you know, excluding other causes of pancreatitis, seeing a patient that comes with recurrent presentations um, and a non-resolving cyst um, and doesn't have risk factors like alcohol or gallstones. If we focus on the cystic tumor specifically, um, it's useful to divide them up pathologically. So if we think about the mucinous uh, tumors, mucinous neoplasms, these of course fall into mucinous cystic neoplasms and IPMNs. And these are really far and away the commonest tumors that are of, of concern to us. Um, serous cyst adenomas, we can talk in detail about these in a short while, um, and, the, the, uh, and are, are almost virtually always benign. Um, and these are the same cysts that are seen uh, in the setting of von Hippel Lindau disease. The other um, cystic tumors that you may come across, or certainly that you should be aware of at a, as a gastroenterology fellow, are uh, spin tumors um, and cystic neuroendocrine tumors um, that undergo uh, cystic degeneration. Much rarer, but um, again, you should have them in your differential, are acinar cell carcinomas, um, and adeno ductal adenocarcinomas that develop some cystic change. But these are, are sufficiently rare that we're not going to talk about those today. All right, so I think 
this is really a, a very useful table. Uh, and I'd encourage all of you to go and find um, this article uh, by the Dutch group in Nature Reviews Gastroenterology Hepatology from 2019. And it's useful because it's a table that really puts all of the tumors that we've just spoken about uh, into sort of a single comparative um, uh, image. And it really includes all of the, the tumors that I think um, you would be expected to know about. Now, I think a good starting point is to consider what are the various, what is the malignant potential of each of these tumors? So if we start with serous cyst adenomas, we see that the malignant potential is basically negligible. Um, looking at the, the, the tumors that then have sort of a lower range of malignancy, if we start at this end of the table, we see that cystic neuroendocrine tumors and spin tumors have about a 10 to 15% uh, malignant transformation rate. Next would be um, small bowel, uh, sorry, side branch IPMN tumors, um, and then MCN tumors, which are probably more or less the same um, and probably sit somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. However, the one that's really of concern, main duct IPMN tumors, here the malignant potential rate jumps up to uh, a mean of around 62 percent. Sorry, just going to switch my phone off here. Thanks. Okay, um, so I think that just gives us a, an idea of which are the ones that we are most concerned about. Okay, so let's start with the less common um, tumors. So spin tumors, these occur almost entirely in young women in their, from their teens to about their early 30s. And um, I'm going to refer to something that Professor Criffio, one of the retired HPV surgeons at at Hrodeskir used to talk about, he used to talk about um, in, in terms of cystic neoplasms as the daughters, the mothers, and the grandmothers. And these, of course, are the daughters. Okay, so almost always female, almost always in their teens to early 30s. Um, often the tumors are incidental in their finding, but when they're symptomatic, they usually present with discomfort, usually of a fairly long duration or potentially mass effects. Now, these tumors can have both, obviously both solid and cystic components, but most of the time when they get big like this, they are, are, are mostly solid. And typically they are solitary. Importantly, there's no communication um, with uh, uh, the pancreatic ductal system. Okay, so that's the, that's the spin tumors. The cystic neuroendocrine tumors, um, so um, these are older patients, uh, equal sex distribution. Um, very typically the ages are, are patients in their 40s and 50s, um, although they can be older as well. Um, and again, these are often incidental findings. Often, most of the time, these patients, these tumors are non-functioning, and the tumors are usually small. However, um, this is a good example of what I was referring to earlier. Um, this is an older patient um, in his 70s, very fit, non-drinker, non-smoker. Um, and presented with attacks of pancreatitis. After about two years um, of having had recurrent uh, attacks, he was investigated with imaging, seen to have this cystic lesion here, um, and that was not further uh, evaluated at that time. It was felt to be uh, a consequence of his pancreatitis. We skip about five or six years down the line, um, his symptoms seem to be worsening, um, and you can see now that in fact the lesion has become more solid, there's compromise of the portal vein, and on EUS, there's a solid mass here um, intimately related to the portal vein, and this lesion is now probably borderline resectable, if at all. And this is a case of where um, this is a very atypical cyst for an inflammatory cyst, plus the patient's having re recurrent attacks of pancreatitis, and this should have been investigated further at that time. Okay. The, the, these cystic uh, neuroendocrine tumors, they can have variable solid components, and it's felt that um, the more cystic lesions are more benign, uh, whereas if there's a solid component, that's when one should become more concerned. Um, okay. Obviously, the, again, there's, there's no, usually no communication with the pancreatic duct, and usually these lesions will also be solitary. Okay. Let's move on to more common things now. Uh, we'll start with the more benign. Um, the serous cystic neoplasms, these are patients, these are usually elderly patients, 
um, patients in their 60s and 70s, most of the time female. Um, and these are usually picked up again, either as an incidental finding or because of pain or mass effect. What's characteristic about the serous cyst adenomas is that they often form a, a multi, have a multi-cystic appearance. Um, here in this case, um, it's probably not microcystic, probably a little bit more macrocystic, but certainly you can appreciate that there's at least three or four sort of cystic components here. And on endoscopic ultrasound, it looks um, even more so. Um, again, so often these are, are described as having a, a honeycomb appearance. One should be cautious because IPMN, especially side branch IPMN, can look like this as well. Um, again, these are usually solitary, except in the, in the setting of Van Hippel-Lindau disease, uh, where one can have even the entire pancreas taken up with, with these cysts. Okay, um, mus now we move on to the mucinous tumors. Firstly, the MCNs. Um, so whereas the serous cyst adenomas, these were occurring in the grandmothers, the spin tumors were occurring in the daughters, these are then the mothers, okay? So again, almost entirely a, a female distribution, uh, patients in their um, 50s to 70, um, and typically this is a unilocular macrocystic lesion. Um, you may hear people talk about a claw sign, uh, which is where you have a little bit of sort of thickened tissue tapering um, around the edge of the, of the cyst. And there may be in about 30% of these, um, some calcifications in the rim uh, of, the, of the cyst. And we call those uh, eggshell calcification. Um, again, these are often solitary. And importantly in this case, because quite often we're faced with a decision of, are we dealing with an MCN or an IPMN, and often the way to, that we may determine that is to detect the presence of amylase or lipase in the cyst fluid. That if that is present, it, in, it indicates uh, ductal communication, which suggests IPMN um, as opposed to uh, an MCN where there isn't ductal communication. So with that, moving on to the IPMN tumors, uh, similar age group, 50s, 60s, early 70s, um, equal gender distribution. And importantly here, of course, is the, the differentiation between main duct IPMN and side branch IPMN. So a main duct IPMN is when you have a main pancreatic duct uh, dilated more than five millimeters without any um, other uh, uh, determinable cause. And the side branch IPMNs are determined by cysts that are greater than five millimeters in size and where there's a communication um, with the pancreatic duct, with the main pancreatic duct, but no dilatation. If there is dilatation greater than five millimeters, well, then you're dealing with a mixed type. Often um, the, the, these may be solitary, but often they're multifocal. Um, and that just reflects the fact that um, uh, IPMN is really a, uh, a field type effect. Um, and you should really consider the, the entire pancreatic ductal system as being um, potentially prone to developing pathology. So if you find it in one place, you should, you should certainly look very carefully elsewhere. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, these patients also have an increased risk of ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, and one should, one should look carefully for this. Um, certainly the two can coexist. These are patients often discovered incidentally, but other presentations include jaundice, pancreatitis, uh, even exocrine insufficiency um, and tumor related symptoms. Okay, so you can see that there's obviously a, a sort of a, a, a fairly wide range of, of pathologies, types of tumors, and, uh, and certainly presentations. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, these are, although this is not sort of common in everyday gastroenterology practice, certainly as a whole, uh, cystic tumor of the pancreas is not an uncommon problem. Um, and certainly something that you need to have a reasonable approach to. So there are three sets of guidelines that um, can provide this for you. I think most people these days would say that the American uh, um, Gastroenterology Association guidelines that were published in 2015 um, are actually relatively vague. 
um, and leave out a lot of detail that is included in the subsequent guidelines that, that have been published. And so I think in most, certainly outside of America, most people would not use the AGIA guidelines. So I'll refer to them, but um, only sort of really in, in passing. So most people, um, probably the best known guidelines are what are called the IAP guidelines, International Association of Pancreatology. Uh, these were first written by um, uh, uh, Tanaka, who is from Fukuoka, and hence they were called the Fukuoka guidelines. But these days, people would probably talk more about the, the IAP, IAP guidelines, and they were last revised in, in 2017. Shortly after that, a European group um, put out European-based uh, guidelines. And while there is a lot of uh, correlation or congruency between these two, um, there are a couple of important differences. I think um, for your purposes, you should be aware that there are two guidelines, and then you should decide which one of them um, you, want to, you want to use. I find um, the IAP guidelines probably uh, the most well-defined or, or rather better defined um, and, and easier to use. So we're gonna go through them, uh, th through these ones, and then I'll point out some of the differences with the European guidelines. So the first thing that it does is look at, differentiate between high-risk stigmata and worrisome features. So if you have high-risk stigmata, and you are jaundiced, have a mural nodule more than five millimeters, or a main pancreatic duct more than 10 millimeters, okay? And as we said that there is no other alternative cause for this um, other than IPMN, well, then you have a sort of clear indications to go straight to surgery. These, these um, findings are highly suggestive of malignancy and correlate well with malignancy um, and you would need a very good reason not to operate uh, on somebody with with these features and and confirmed IPMN. okay right if you have episodes of pancreatitis again that would be a very a strong uh, push toward so it's very patient will tolerate um, because what you don't want is a patient having a of pancreatitis sufficiently severe to, to preclude them ever having a resection or, or something like that. Other imaging uh, findings of concern would be meters less than five millimeters, thickness walls, um, a main duct of five to 10 millimeters, um, abrupt changes in the caliber of a pancreatic duct, uh, lymphadenopathy, raised CA-99, and a cyst growth rate of more than five millimeters over two years. If you have any of these features, it's suggested that you have an endoscopic ultrasound. And at endoscopic ultrasound, um, what should you be looking for? Well, again, mural nodules and measuring these carefully. And I wanted to point out this junction, we'll try and demonstrate that for you a little bit later. But I think it's important to appreciate that endoscopic ultrasound really gives you the best imaging um, of these cystic lesions and of um, uh, uh, any sort of components of them like mural nodules. So you can see how it's cross-sectional imaging uh, suggested that a, you know, a mural nodule is less than five millimeters, but you get better measurement of it via an EUS. Um, and this is where this scenario might arise, uh, where the EUS actually tells you it's more than five millimeters away beforehand you thought it was less. Um, of course, if there are main duct features that are suspicious, again, this is a bit vague, uh, but again, you're looking for thickened walls, mural nodules, usually you can see projections um, into, into the ductal space. And then, of course, you can get some cytology, and if there's anything suspicious on cytology, um, then these features would make, again, push you uh, towards surgery. Okay. If, however, um, uh, none of these features are present, then really what you're going to be guided by mostly is the size of the larger cyst, okay? If the cyst is less than a centimeter, you can continue just with cross-sectional imaging, first in six months, and then uh, you can extend the period later on. Um, again, uh, let one to two centimeters, repeat imaging in six months, um, and then probably in a year, and then after that, two yearly. 
I want to point out here that they've said CT or MRI. Um, I disagree with this quite, quite strongly. MRI gives you much better definition of what is happening in a cyst. Um, and if you're talking about a small cyst that you are trying to observe closely, um, then really MRI, and, and you're only going to use cross-sectional imaging, well, then MRI um, is, should be your modality of choice. If we're getting more concerned, um, so now we're talking about a cyst that's two to three centimeters, um, this should be looked at with EUS, um, firstly three to six monthly, and then you can slowly increase your intervals um, up to one year, but possibly alternating with MRI. But at this point, if you have a young fit patient, you should really be thinking about whether it isn't better to, to just resect. Um, certainly, once you get more than three centimeters, um, this, this really should be an indication for surgery. Uh, and you should have a good reason if you're not going to operate. Um, and if you're not going to operate, you should be watching these patients very closely um, with MRI and EUS. Okay. Um, all right. This is now the European guidelines, okay? And how they look at it, there is some uh, uh, sort of congruency. Um, so where, where the guidelines basically agree is in those indications for which you go straight to surgery. And you'll remember uh, main duct more than 10 millimeters, mural nodule more than five, presence of jaundice. Those were all there before. Um, they do include here positive cytology, um, although how you would have got that at this point without having gone further down the algorithm is not entirely clear. But if for whatever reason you've got positive cytology, that's an absolute indication. And then they include also the presence of a solid mass. So if you have any of these absolute indications, then you go to surgery. Um, that's kind of a bit of, so that's really just a, a no brainer. And that's, as I said, in keeping with um, what the IAP guidelines say. All right. What they then do, though, is they talk about relative indications, again, for worrisome features, except that the growth rate is more than five millimeters per year, not per two years. Uh, then specifics of the CA99. Um, they mentioned new onset diabetes, which IAP doesn't. Pancreatitis, of course, that was there before, and enhancing nodules less than five millimeters. Now, if you have one of these relative in the relative indications, what or one or two, shall we say? They say if that you if you are young and fit without significant comorbidities, and you've got one relative indication, then you go to surgery. If you have if you do have significant comorbidities, then you need two. Uh, relative indications in order to go to surgery. On the other hand, um, if you have uh, significant comorbidities and only one relative indication or no indications for surgery, then you undergo intensive surveillance. And that's with clinical evaluation, uh, serum 99 and MRI and or EUS. Okay, so if we look at the, you know, if we compare these directly, um, as I said a moment ago, um, really there's much agreement between what the high risk stigmata are or the absolute indications for surgery. Okay, we've been through that. So positive cytology in a solid mass are, are different here, but jaundice enhancing mural nodules more than five and ductal dilatation more than 10 um, are all sort of uh, uh, indications to go to, to theater and, 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 the, and the guidelines agree in that. Okay. They do refer to mucinous cystic neoplasms. IAP guidelines suggest that all MCNs should come out. Um, I think we would probably follow that um, to a, a greater or lesser degree, unless we had a MCN tumor that was small, non-worrisome, and in a patient who's not a good candidate for surgery. Um, the European guidelines, again, refer to things that we've really spoken about in terms of size more than four centimeters, mural nodules um, and, and symptoms. Okay, but the big difference, as we mentioned a moment ago, is really what to do when you have uh, either what I'll refer to as worrisome features or, or relative indications. 
So we already said that the, 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 the two are very similar, the criteria are very similar. Um, it's really just differences in cyst size, um, presence of lymphadenopathy, um, and the growth rate being at uh, five millimeters over two years or, or one year. Um, and then uh, serum CA99 is defined at more than 37, and we mentioned diabetes. Otherwise, it's, it, they're, they're very similar. But what they tell you to do is slightly different, okay? The decision-making is heavily, in IAP, is heavily based on EUS in terms of whether you go to surgery or surveillance. The decision-making for the Europeans is more based on comorbidities um, and, and uh, whether you have one or two features um, to, to go with your comorbidities. So to look at it a different way, if we look at indications for US, well, we've covered that very clearly in IAP. Um, Europeans are basically saying, well, if it's going to change your clinical management um, and if the clinical or radiological features of concern, which we've pretty much already decided they are. So um, for me, the European guidelines are not really uh, um, helpful in terms of um, what you should do with your initial presentation, should you be doing an EUS or not. Uh, and my general feeling would be that you probably should be. The guidelines, a couple of things that the guidelines don't address, address at all. Um, and that's what to do with uh, uh, diagnostic difficulties um, and, and alternative diagnoses. Uh, we live in an area endemic for TB. Um, and we've certainly seen uh, um, uh, tuberculosis uh, presenting and masquerading as, as a cystic tumor. So again, you know, I think this, this is where um, um, EUS has a role. In addition, um, cross-sectional imaging has certain limitations. Uh, I'll try and show you some of that in a moment. Um, and of course, EUS may be better at differentiating different types of cysts, especially when they are multi-cystic um, or there are lots of septations. And what the guidelines don't address at all is really the value of tissue. Um, that's in detecting high-grade dysplasia, uh, detecting malignancy, where perhaps neoadjuvant treatment um, might be the appropriate way to go. And then there's no mention really of different role um, or the role of different IPMN subtypes. And in particular here, uh, I put in this slide just to show you. So these are the different types that you get. Gastric uh, type IPMN has a, a percentage of invasive progression of only 10% whereas pancreatic biliary type jumps up to almost 70%. So there's really um, the chance for invasive progression is, is different um, uh, between these different types. Exactly how this should factor into decision-making um, is not clear at present. I want to come back to um, the issue of, of cross-sectional imaging for a moment and just talk about CT versus MRI. Um, and, and I think what's important is that you should be combining MRI with MRCP. Um, and you need to be very specific in requesting both of these uh, when you put in your radiology requests with, with the radiologist. Um, every now and again, you know, we, our, our fellow, our, our registrar just writes one, um, and then only the one gets done and not the other. So you, you need to ask for MRI and MRCP. But certainly magnetic resonance is better in terms of accurate sizing, uh, detecting ductal communication, estimating main duct involvement, um, and identifying additional um, uh, or small branch, side branch cysts. Um, there is some debate about um, whether MR is better for, for mural nodules uh, or septations. But I'm going to show you an example. Um, this is a patient from the Eastern Cape that we recently saw. Um, you can appreciate that in the unsinted process, um, there is a clear, well-defined um, hyperdense lesion. But it's quite difficult to characterize this further or, or say anything further, um, aside from the fact that there's a hyperdense area in keeping with a cyst. If we look at the MR imaging, however, we see that there's this sort of lobulated nature, or certainly there is um, a septation um, within the, the um, within the cyst, that would be uh, would certainly arouse your interest, if not your concern. Um, and in addition, we can see how the cyst clearly communicates um, with the pancreatic duct. 
um, indicating that this is clearly uh, a, a side branch IPMN, whereas you would not have known that, nor would you have known uh, or, or, or suspected the concerning septation unless you looked really, really carefully. Okay, moving on to, to EUS. Um, and it's sort of comparison with, with what, what we've just mentioned. Um, EUS F, FNA with biopsy is the most sensitive diagnostic modality and is best able to correctly classify the cystic neoplasms. It also has a better nodule and septation detection rate. Um, and it's the best for visualizing um, the pancreatic duct. So again, same patient, okay? Here's the MRI with the, the cyst and the septation and the ductal communication. Um, but here we can see, um, the obviously, there's the dilated pancreatic duct. Here is the cyst. Um, I'm sorry, I've cut off the measurements um, to preserve the patient's identity. Um, but um, uh, we can say that this is probably, it's about a two and a half centimeter cyst. Um, and this duct is um, more or less uh, four to five millimeters. But I think what's what's really important is that where we would be looking, um, so again, you can you can appreciate that we can very precisely determine our measurements here. Um, but really the big issue here is that um, we can pick up this mural nodule, which is probably related to the septation that we saw. But this solid component, this papillary projection here, I'll tell you that we measured at eight millimeters. And that would make us concerned. This is something that would, might push you towards resection, or certainly in terms of the guidelines, should push you towards resection, um, whereas the MRI might not have done that for you. Okay, so what are the things that we can do at endoscopic ultrasound? So first of all, I'm going to start over here and come back to that in a minute, because um, fluid obviously is the easiest thing to get from the assist and the lowest risk thing to do. Um, this, if you send fluid alone for cytological analysis, that's got a sensitivity of about 30%. Um, if you increase, you can improve that by doing mural biopsies. So what you can do, here's a needle going to the cyst. You can pass biopsy forceps through this and biopsy the wall of the cyst. However, that is quite tricky. Um, but if you aspirate the cyst to dryness and then biopsy the wall, that's when you get a fine needle biopsy cytology, and that can give you a sensitivity up to around 70 to 90%. But what we use mostly is tumor markers in the cyst fluid, um, and typically we use a CEA. Um, the sort of published cutoff level is still accepted as 192, although some authors have suggested that um, much lower levels can be, can be utilized um, down to um, uh, as low as 20. Um, but I think that still probably still needs to be validated. Um, elevated glucose levels are also an indicator um, of, uh, of a mucinous lesion. So what's important about these values, and in particular the CA of 192, what does it tell you? It tells you that you're dealing with a mucinous lesion. It tells you that you've got either an IPMN or an MCN, okay? It doesn't tell you that it's malignant, all right? So it doesn't imply malignancy or carcinoma. It just tells you that you're dealing with a mucinous lesion and not uh, a serous cyst adenoma, for example, um, or a cystic neuroendocrine tumor or a spend tumor, okay? What you can then do, so, so if you get a cystic lesion and you aspirate it and you get a mucin level of 500, Okay, you know it's a mucinous lesion. Your next question is, well, is it an IPMN or is it an MCN? Um, and that you can determine by checking the, the amylase or lipase uh, in the cyst fluid, because obviously the one will have a high value, the IPMNs will have high values, and the, and the MCNs will not. There are some other things that can be done, like molecular DNA analysis and mucin expression. Um, however, this is really mostly done in, in research settings, um, and we haven't pursued that um, to a large degree. Okay, so um, I think that really brings me to the conclusion. Um, pancreatic cystic lesions remain diverse. Um, they're potentially complex group of conditions with, with variable implications. The challenge remains balancing uh, the malignant risk 
um, against subjecting patients to unnecessary, unnecessary surgery, considering the fact that these are often very common, uh, common tumors, um, if you believe uh, autopsy studies. Um, MRI and MRCP, I think we've clearly uh, um, uh, delineated as the preferred cross-sectional imaging, um, but endoscopic ultrasound does have distinct, uh, distinct added advantages. Um, although there probably still needs to be consensus on its precise role. Certainly, it gives you better diagnostic clarity and additional information, uh, especially where decision-making is difficult. The guidelines are in agreement regarding high-risk features that are clear indications for surgery, but there's not yet consensus on evaluation and management of relative risk or worrisome lesions. And really, what probably needs to happen is these, should be, these patients should be individualized, um, and their therapy based on the degree of suspicion for a sinister lesion, and this is where EUS will be helpful, and balance this against the patient's general health and comorbidities. And really, an MDT is the right place um, for these patients to be discussed and managed. Okay, I think that that will bring me to the end of my talk. I specifically wanted to, I think this is a topic that um, uh, people come and ask me a lot of questions about. Um, and so I wanted to leave some time for questions um, because, as I say, my impression is that people do find this a bit of a uh, confusing topic. Okay, so the floor is open. Hi, boss. Hi. Uh, get yeah, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, do you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, <clears throat> this is Samani from WITS. Uh, I'd like to uh, express my thanks for this uh, very nice talk and very uh, <clears throat> approach for, for cystic lesions of the pancreas. I'm really <clears throat> asking about real scenarios. Yes, I had a patient a young patient, actually. Sorry, Mohammed, you're just becoming a little bit. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I think just maybe try and speak into the microphone. Can you hear me here? That's much better. Okay, so my question is that uh, when you encounter a patient with uh, main pancreatic duct, uh, like kind of mixed mixed uh, uh, side branch and, uh, and 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 main pancreatic duct lesions. And the lesion in by the by the the cystic lesion by the by the tail of the pancreas. So what option left behind this patient if the patient is having also right-sided disease like the patient presenting with jaundice? Mm. So probably the patient's having right disease and left disease as well. Yeah. So look, I mean your your options there are. <laughs> are not few, it, it, it would depend a little bit on the specifics of the patient, um, whether you're gonna look at, at some kind of pancreatic preserving operation. But um, I think certainly when we're dealing with, with multifocal disease, and you always need to be concerned about the potential for multifocal disease. Um, the, as I said, you know, IPMN in particular, it's a field defect type of scenario. Um, you shouldn't consider it a, a focal disease. And so certainly we always look for additional disease, uh, additional sites of disease. Um, and I think it's, I didn't really get into the surgical management, but certainly when we operate for IPMN, what is critical is we'll always evaluate the cut margin where we've done our division and, and do frozen section on that to assess whether there is uh, dysplasia present at the, at the surgical margin. Now, if there is, it does depend on what you've got. If, if you've got low-grade dysplasia, we'd be, we, you would weigh up the risks uh, and benefits for the patient, but low-grade dysplasia is not an absolute indication for a section. High-grade dysplasia obviously is. Um, I think what is particularly useful in these circumstances, and you may, uh, in certain circumstances, even consider this preoperatively, is the value of... Um, pancreatic ductal endoscopy uh, or pancreatoscopy. Um, certainly I've utilized that intraoperatively. It has changed my management when I found additional lesions. 
Um, and certainly that's something that I would do in the in the case that that you're describing. But I think, you know, if in your scenario, if you were talking about a young patient uh, with multifocal disease, say, you know, if there's disease in the head and you commit it to a Whipple, um, I think to uh, leave an anastomosis together with a, uh, a divided tail, um, it's probably asking for trouble. And I'm not sure um, that there's a good rationale for that. Um, I think most people would probably consider um, um, uh, uh, a total pancreatectomy in those circumstances. And you might look at strategies that would be available to you in a young patient to uh, you know to limit diabetes. So you could always uh, you you wouldn't you wouldn't consider portal vein uh, um, uh, uh, cell transplantation in, in that scenario. Um, but you might decide um, if you could uh, leave a very small uh, portion of pancreatic tail um, behind, provided you weren't leaving any ductal disease. That might be one consideration. But I, but I think in most hands, people would probably do a total pancreatectomy in that scenario. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Wanga. Hi, Sean. Thanks for the lecture. Um, my question is, um, I know it's guidelines, the FAC walk or in terms of the high risk uh, features, you know, those patients with obstructive jaundice and, and so on. You know, in your opinion, do you think it would be worthwhile to just also maybe EUS those uh, patients in that category before embarking on such an invasive uh, uh, resection operation? I mean, uh, we do know that there are conditions, even though it may be less likely, uh, that may mimic uh, the same uh, condition as IPMN. Do you think uh, one should maybe try EUS? I know it's guidelines, they say you should resect those, uh, those cases. I don't know what your opinion is on that. So, so Wanga, I think, I think that's a really good question um, because I think conceptually that's where there is a little bit of a problem. And, and, and what I've done is I've, I've, I've crystallized it, I've sort of crystallized it out a little bit. I think the, the, what is the purpose of the, of the endoscopic ultrasound in that scenario? It's to confirm the diagnosis. It's to um, differentiate between, uh, to exclude something else that you might, that you might manage in a different way. Um, that's the role of the EUS in that setting. The role of the EUS in, in those high risk features is not to decide you know, if you know that this is IPMN, the EUS is not to decide whether you should operate or not. The EUS is to exclude another pathology. Um, bearing in mind that, you know, inflammatory cysts are far more common. Uh, we live in a um, uh, in a population where TB is endemic. Um, there's very uncommon. It's always a chance of hydatid disease. So I think you, you one's just got to crystallize it out. What the algorithms are, what, what the guidelines are telling you is how do you treat a patient that you know has IPMN or MCN for that matter? Um, the EUS is A, either there to make a diagnosis or confirm your diagnosis or exclude other things, or in the guidelines, it's there to look at specific things to, or to, to get um, to help guide your, your management of the IPMN in certain circumstances. But that's why I also put that slide there where the, the guidelines don't talk about how you address diagnostic difficulty. They don't talk about the value of tissue. Um, you know, and so there might be, there I think are some, some gray areas. I mean, you know, we, we had a, a patient last, a week or two ago uh, that we were unsure whether it was chronic pancreatitis or IPMN, what have you. And once we did the diagnosis, we actually got back, well, it's, it's IPMN, but in fact, it's got carcinoma within it. And so we're going to give that patient neoadjuvant therapy first. So, you know, nowhere do the, you know, the guidelines don't address those sorts of issues. Um, so, yeah, I think one just needs to look at it in, in that context. I hope I've answered your question. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I think you've provided some clarity. Sean Mazama has a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Um, thanks. Where where do we? Okay. So the things that so cyst fluid analysis. Where do we where do we include that um, in the algorithm? So again, I think those are we utilize those as diagnostic, um, or, or or rather where that is in current practice is from a diagnostic perspective. Okay. Um, the, the guidelines are looking at, do you see features um, that are of concern? Uh, and potentially, if you see a feature of concern, so let's say, uh, let's say you've got a, a 60 year old woman, uh, she's got a touch of hypertension, she's got a two and a half centimeter um, cyst or two centimeter cyst, and there's a, five millimeter nodule okay or a four millimeter nodule okay what what can you do in that scenario so there i think you would want to aspirate that cyst and send it for cytology you would want to try and uh, using an intra intraneedle forceps try and biopsy the nodule directly uh, to see if there's any high grade dysplasia and you might want to fna the wall of the cyst to see if there's any high grade dysplasia. Of course, you might get back that it's all bland and it's a serous cyst adenoma. Well, then you know, don't need to do anything further. So again, I think what, what one's got to do is one's got to differentiate between, do you want cyst fluid for diagnosis, which is most of what those things offer you. So see a, you know, if you see um, a small lesion uh, in the head, it's maybe got one septation, and you do a CEA, and the CEA comes back at two, um, and maybe the lipase is a, a thousand. Well, then you know it's actually a pseudocyst. Um, on the other hand, if the CEA comes back at 400, well, you know you've got a mucinous lesion, um, and that's going to prompt you perhaps to do something about it. So I think one must either look at it from the perspective of diagnostics. Are you looking to confirm that this is a cystic neoplasm? And if so, a cystic neoplasm that warrants surveillance stroke intervention? Or are you looking at this, do you need something to help you uh, in your decision-making, in your, in your management of the cyst? In which case, we're talking about those advanced things of actually getting some tissue. Mzamo, does that, does that answer your question adequately? Thank you so much, Prof. Yeah, uh, the last couple of comments to, to, to put to perspective. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Yelda. Hi, Sean. Thanks for the presentation. I just need a clarification. We know that the IPM, when it happens and it obstructs the duct, it causes an upstream dilation. But not all the dilations, like anti-grade dilation of the duct, can happen because of the mucus production of the um, um, of the disease itself. So if that results, if that mucus is causing like a mucus plug and causing an obstructive jaundice and the lesion you're having in the tail or the body, whether you're gonna go ahead with a total pancreatectomy or just a left pancreatectomy would be suffice for this patient. Uh, um, let me just check that I've understood you correctly, Yelda. Are, are you saying that there is sort of a, a dominance or side lesion in the body or tail, and then uh, dilatation of the, of the duct as well beyond a certain point. Yes. And Yeah, so I think, you know, what you would, what again, what you can do in these circumstances is um, twofold. You know, you can consider um, a resection of um, of what clearly needs to come out and then do frozen section on the um, on the cut margin and see you know what is happening is there disease involving the duct or was it just distension from mucus but usually if you're seeing if you're seeing a dilated main, main duct as well usually what you're dealing with is is mixed type disease uh, and probably then you need to do an operation that deals with all of the suspected disease. But again, this is where, and again, this doesn't come into, into the guidelines. And that is what is the role, say, of pancreatoscopy in, in that scenario? Because I, I, think, I think it would have a very definite role there. 
And certainly what you could do is you could do pancreatoscopy of the, the head and the, uh, and the neck. And if the mucosa of, of, the, of the pancreatic duct looks normal, then, you, then you've got sort of a, a justification for doing just the left. Um, if you see any abnormality in the, in the duct within the head and neck, well, then you can biopsy that. Um, and you're going to have a much lower threshold for, for considering perhaps total. So that okay. would be my approach. Okay, thank you. And Sean, um, just another question. When you're going to go for a genetic studying in the, in the cases of a cystic neoplasm of the pancreas? <laughs> well, in an ideal world, everyone. <laughs> but... No, so is there is there a familial relationship? There is. Um, I think, yeah, there aren't really. Well, I'm not aware of of guidelines for that specifically. Um, but you know, the right answer would be, you know, if it's if it was available to do it in everybody, um, but then that would be true of any malignancy now these days. Um, so I think what you're probably going to be doing it is looking at. Um, uh, uh patients who present who are clearly very young um so you know maybe you're going to consider either less than 50 or less than 40 um and certainly if there's any familial familial disease so i think in our setting that's that's probably would be the right answer um if you are in the first world where and you're part of a um a research institution then you'd probably do it as often as you can Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Sean. <clears throat> uh, just with refer to the elders' uh, question regarding the uh, uh, pancreatic uh, Do you do you mean a preoperative work workup? as part of the preoperative uh, workup of this patient, we do them kind of uh, pancreatic endoscopy in terms of like a spike glass or what, what do you mean? Is it intraoperative decision or interoperative thing or preoperative? So, so it, it could be either, you know, um, you know, if you're going to, um, you know, if you're going to be doing your resection and depending on where you're going to be, what you're going to be resecting and what, and what, uh, what your access to the duct is, you can do it intraoperatively. Um, but if you feel like it's going to influence how you're going to proceed operatively, um, then you could do it um, as an endoscopic procedure preoperatively. So I think it, it, it very much depends on what the um, uh, what the individual circumstances are like, and and what you perhaps need to counsel the patient about, um, and what decision making you need to do beforehand. Um, and, and yes, what we're talking about is spyglass. I think I think an important issue to remember is that you know if you're if you're concerned about the duct, it's usually because there's dilatation, um, and that means that uh, a pancreatoscopy is actually going to be relatively easier. Um, so passing passing the scope down the duct is, is probably not going to be that difficult. Um, and certainly, if you've got main duct or, or mixed type, um, usually the ampulla is pretty dilated as well with mucus. So, so access is, is not too much of a problem, um, but it's also, you know, depending on what operation you're planning, um, it may not be, it may be easy to do it intraoperatively as well. So both of those are options available to you, um, and you need to decide on an individual basis which one, which one is going to work best in, in any given circumstance. Another question, Sean. Uh, what are you going to do for, like, uh, focal center lesion? I'm sorry, say again? Focal central lesion, like segmental lesion by the neck. Okay. Or... So, so the answer to that is, I'm afraid I have to turn it around. <laughs> sounds, like I'm, sounds like I'm sitting on the fence a lot. I don't mean to. <laughs> no. What, you, the answer to that question is whether you believe in central pancreatectomies or not. Okay. Um, and for the surgeons in the audience, that's, that's an important topic um, that you need to kind of have an answer to. So the short answer to that is that um, you, central pancreatectomies are accepted. 
um, but they have a higher complication rate. So again, you need to decide, it's, it's all risk benefit. You need to decide whether um, your patient is going to cope with the higher risk profile um, if, and, um, and, and if so, kind of what, what benefit are you offering by exposing them to that, to that greater risk profile? You know, is your central operation, are you going to be taking that degree of pancreas away um, that the patients can, uh, are not going to cope without it? I must say, I think when, when you think, when you think in terms of, um, you know, pancreatic function and how much pancreatic function an individual needs, when you're talking about a normal pancreas, um, remember you need 10% of your pancreas really to function normally. Okay, that's what, in other words, to maintain exocrine and endocrine sufficiency. And I must say, I don't, so I'm not a proponent of central pancreatectomies. I don't believe that there is that much benefit in leaving, a, you know, a bit of tail behind that you're going to do uh, another anastomosis to that has the potential to leak. Um, I... I, I, so I don't believe in it, and I would perform uh, a left pancreatectomy. Just I, I would just be taking uh, my resection margin is obviously just going to be more into the head to the right of the portal vein. But I, I believe that usually you can leave sufficient um, uh, uh, sufficient head behind um, to maintain uh, sufficiency. If if you can't leave sufficient head behind to maintain sufficiency, well then you should probably be doing a Whipple anyway. Thank you. That's uh, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. Good. Um, Sean, I'm sorry. Um, do you believe in inoculations with the br brine side IPNM, IPMN? Uh, sorry, say again. Um, what do you um, what is your um opinion regarding? inoculations on the branch side IPMN if you're not having any worrisome features. Sorry, inoculations? Yes. Uh, sorry, do you mean ablation? No, it's like um, inoculation, like how we do it, like for an insulinoma, we inoculate the lesion. There are oh, some... Nucleation? Nucleation, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think... I haven't seen anything really on that. Um, I wouldn't say that that is a is a well described approach. Um, I think your problem there is that, you know, what you the, these operations that you're doing you're doing for oncological reasons, um, and so it should be an oncological operation. So I've definitely never I definitely haven't seen anything about enucleation. Um, there is some some information on ablation um but again that that's that data is is not extensive and really the kind of the type of patient that you're going to do that on is really going to be very few and far between um it might be a patient with a significant size cyst um without concerning features uh, but the patient's either symptomatic from it or um, is kind of has a reasonable life expectancy, but isn't really fit for an operation. So, because you, you kind of got two competing uh, concepts there. You know, the one is that you know if your patient's not fit for an operation, well then don't don't follow them uh, because you're not going to do anything if even if you pick up a, a malignant lesion or or a premalignant lesion. Um, on the other hand, if you've um, if you've got a lesion um, and you're fit enough, well, then you should probably and and, it, and there's an indication for a section, then you should probably do that. So for me, it's a very gray area um, ablation at the moment. Um, I think it's far more appropriate for for neuroendocrine neoplasms, um, especially functional ones that uh, that you can't resect for or or enucleate for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we have come to the end of the questions, Sean. Hmm. Um, if we can just say the thank yous.
you like to look at your email I sent you, or I can just say it quickly. It's just to thank you, um, the ECHO Foundation, for um, providing the platform for this, University of New Mexico, Team India for providing the background support. Thanks to the Gastro Foundation, thanks to our presenters, and to advertise next week, um, Monday next week, it's Martin Brand, and the topic is um, chronic pancreatitis. So, yeah, okay. thank you very much, Karen. Yeah. See you next week. Bye, Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.